I go into the pen there with a bottle of maybe two litres of colostrum and give them to the calf straight away. And I tend to leave the calf with the cow for maybe 12 to 18 hours, depending on what time the cow calves at, you know, before she goes to the parlour. And take away the calf then, put in the calf shed, and uh, the calves get um, whole milk then. And the way it is here for the last few years, I haven't sold any calves off the farm under 21 days. So they get a good start here before they go on to their next home. Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and on this week's joint episode of the Beef and Dairy Edge Podcast, I'm joined with my colleague Emma Louise Coffey and dairy farmer Paul Delaney to discuss the importance of genetics in the dairy beef system to maximise performance and profitability. Emma Louise starts with Paul giving an overview of his system. Cows are out at grass whenever they get a chance but I would be trying to get out the cows during the day and keep them in at night at the moment and to have a strong work two thirds of the way through the calf and, and touch wood everything is going okay and when you talk about grazing conditions are difficult I think everyone listening in can can uh, feel that pain um, you know you have to work harder this year to get cows out um, a lot a lot of rainfall you mentioned two thirds of, of cows have calved at this stage we're, we're on the last day of February when did you start? I started I think around the 3rd of February so I did this when I started I don't like starting in January because look usually you'd be inside a lot and it does take a lot of feed to keep the cow, cow conditions up and the quicker you can get them to grass after calving, obviously the more milk they'll put in the jar, you know, so. that That's, yeah, as you say, a no-brainer, you know, feeding cow silage versus spring grass, there's a, there's a huge difference in terms of the the, the quality that you're, you're dealing with there. Um, In terms then, uh, Paul, I suppose it's not just cows you're dealing with. What else is happening on farm? Well, I have a beef enterprise also, and I do a bit of tillage in the farm as well. And and tell us about the beef enterprise. What does that look like? I do, I do buy in store bulls and, and finish them. And I do buy and some store heifers and graze them on the grass and finish them also. And, and then in relation to the tillage? Tillage, grow malt and barley and some winter wheat. That's what I have this year. And previously, Paul, prior to starting into dairy, you had a beef suckler enterprise. What kind of system did you operate? That's right, Catherine. I had... um. I had a suckler, suckler cows. I used to run 55 suckler cows here and used to bring everything to beef. I killed the bulls under 16 months and I finished the heifers off the grass. I think they were between 16 and 20 months. And now with the dairy system, what's your breeding policy? How has that changed? Well, I at the moment, I'm doing it just to make things handy for myself. I'm selling the, the Frisian bull calves off the farm and also the, the continental calves I'm selling them off the farm as well and I'm keeping I'm keeping um uh 24 25 Frisian heifers and I bring the I put them in calf and then if I have surplus to sell I'll sell them if I don't need them and what are you looking for when you're selecting bulls and straws for your system and my system well I I'm running a kind of a Holstein Frisian cow uh look there would be something like the suckler cow I had to be kind of an easy cow to look at you know to be a good strong cow and when I'm selecting straws I'd be for the dairy end of things I kind of go a bit on EBI and also work a bit on classification and and go under build recordings and stuff like that you know before selectables and last year was my first year to use sex semen and I, I used it on cows. I didn't get a chance to put it on heifers because it didn't work out. But um, I was very, very happy with the results now. And it's given me confidence going forward to be more selective with the sex semen and also to pick some other outcross bulls as well to try to develop or improve me genetics on the herd. And also, I won't have to use, after building up the confidence with the Sex semen, I won't have to use as many Frisian on me cows. Frisian bulls on me cows, so I'll be looking more on the continentals on the remainder of the herd. The criteria, Paul, for the cow that you put a sex straw into in 2023, can you tell us about that? Well, in 2023, uh, I got the sex semen straws late. So basically, 
whatever cows were bulling on the day they got the straws it's not the right way to do it but it's just just the way it happened last spring but this spring I hope to um go on me milk recordings over last year and me top maybe top 35 to 40 percent of cows I will use them to breed out with the sex semen straws and also uh, other um straws as well, other Frisian straws as well that are not sexed. There's maybe one or two new bulls, and the remainder of the herd, then I'll I'll uh, put them to beef bulls. And, and when you talk about the beef bull, you, you mentioned the word continental, and I guess you know there historically where you're producing um calves for non replacements, a lot of dairy farmers will go to the Angus or the Hereford with the idea of there's potentially easier calving relative to a continental. Can you, can you tell us the the type of um, beef bull you're using? And, you know, I suppose your experience of uh, gestation length uh, calving difficulty from them. Yeah, well, I've... Going on last year's records, I, there was three bulls I used on the continentals, and that was LM2014, which was limousine, and LM... 5443 and I used a Belgian blue as well uh, BB4494 I think are the codes now don't hold me to ransom on that but uh, I'd have no fear of working them bulls on the Frisian cows because from my change over to Suckland to, to Darien I couldn't get over how quick the Frisian cow calves when she starts calving towards a continental cow or suckler cow be arsing around for three or four hours before they get a water bag out and then they're up and down and up and down towards the Frisian cow just puts out the water bag and she gets on with it. She puts out the calf. They're, they're a, a serious cow to calf. And that that's an interesting comment. Um, why do you think it is the case? I mean, you're, you're comparing two different types of cows. Um, you know, I would suggest that potentially the calf that the dairy cow has grown is a slightly smaller animal given that, you know, she herself is a smaller animal than your typical suckler cow. But can, can you, I suppose, give any real explanation from your experience on that? Um, I think I think the cows, they open up naturally, they open up better. And they're, they're kind of a fitter cow too to calf. And like they're not overly fat, like, like where some sucklers would be. You know, when you be calving some suckler cows or suckler bred heifers, if you have to jack them sometimes, there there seem to be a lot of fat deposit around their passageways, and you can see the the, the bits of fat coming out in the afterbirth, and you don't seem to have that with the with the Frisian cow. And and that idea of assisting, um, like you know, you have um, you know, two thirds of your herd calf now of the cows that are delivering continental calves. You know, are, are you assisting many of those in terms of, um, you know, the calving jack or, you know, a, a little bit of a pull or are they, you know, tending to do it themselves? They're tending to do it themselves because I would be I would be putting the the, <clears throat> the beef straws on, say, second calvers onwards. You know, my, my heifers would all get a Frisian, a Frisian uh, straw or a Frisian bull to run with them and... Today at Touchwood, I've I've had no problems. But when I be selecting the bulls, I be a devil at looking at their gestation length. Do you know if if the bulls are calving on their just if they have the short gestation length, I tend to use those kind of bulls. And also, I prefer to have. If you look into the 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 linear scoring on the on the bulls. I prefer to have a more musclier bull or more musclier bu- uh, bull than a skeleton, than a bone bull, because it's easier pull out a muscle calf out of a cow because the muscle will give, if you know what I mean. But if you have a bony calf, the bone won't give. That's where you run into difficulties with calving. That's just my experience now over the years. And you've touched on on the gestation length point. Uh, any concerns there in terms of um, the continental type calf that you're dealing with in the last number of years? Is it adding days onto the gestation? Not not adding on days in the particular ones I'm using because my I'm going by me ICBF report. I'm I meant I my my calf and average is three hundred and sixty four days. So like. 
they're not taking any effect on the herd that way. So, so yeah, your your ca- your cow is calving once every year. It's not falling into 13, 14 months. Yeah. Now, what you will find, some of the Frisian calves that are in calf to the cow, some of them could calve five or six or maybe 10 days earlier than their calf, than their due date. But the, the Continentals, the more than likely would get, the worst case scenario could be a day or two over, but the majority of them are calving within two or three days of their date, of their calving date, sorry. And Paul, in relation to the calves when they land on the ground, how are you managing those from once they're born until they're sold? Well, basically, they get colostrum anyway, as quick as you can. You know, I have um, I go into the pen there with a bottle of maybe two litres of colostrum and give them to the calf straight away. And three, it's navel cord with iodine. Now, I tend to leave the calf with the cow for maybe 12 to 18 hours, depending on what time the cow calves at, you know, before she goes to the parlour. And take away the calf, then put in the calf shed, and uh, the calves get um whole milk then, so to do. And the way it is here for the last few years, I haven't sold any calves off the farm under twenty one days, so they get a good start here before they go on to their next um home. And how much milk are they getting every day up till the twenty one days to when they're sold? Well, they'll be starting probably around four liters for three or four days, and then they're up to a gallon, and then probably be on six litres a day before they leave here. And have you a market for those calves or what's your current sale for those calves? Yeah, well, I do. I I have two customers that are coming here since I started dairying and one man is buying the Frisian cal- bull calves off me and the other man is buying Continentals. And if I have a few Continental surplus, then I go to the market. And how important is it for you to have that repeat buyer coming back year on year versus time that you spend going to the mart? It's vital. It's vital because, like, when you're in the middle of calving season, you can't afford, like, I'm a, kind of a one-man operation. I have help at the weekends, all right. But you can't afford to be taking days away from the farm to go to the mart to sell your calves, you know, and cows could be calving at home. You could lose a calf, you know, so that's it, it, it's vitally important to have that relationship with, um, with me buyers. Are you a price setter, Paul, or a price taker with those two customers? What way does that relationship work? on an annual basis well i would be keeping an eye on the market and what way what way it's going and look i wouldn't be trying to get the last euro out of my um customers because they're very important i want them to come back to me next year and i'm I'm hoping to be selling them a good quality calf and look i to try be fair for both sides for myself and for them that is the one of the reasons maybe that they keep coming back to you that I suppose there's a good respect there and you know as you say you're not screwing them for the last euro um, and you're providing a good quality animal you know it's interesting no calf sold um, before 21 days of age maybe just to get some of your expertise Catherine if you don't mind um, you know take me as a, as a farmer who's picking DBI bulls you know, in the next two, three weeks um, to get them into the flask for the breeding. You know, are there any traits or targets um, that I should be looking at if I'm looking at DBI straws? Yeah, I suppose, Emma Louise, you're really looking at the sub-indexes within the DBI. So for farmers looking at selecting sires that have a high DBI, that's not really enough. You're really looking at how that figure is being made up. So say for a farmer like Paul that has a Frisian cow herd, he should be looking at sires with a beef sub-index of plus 100 euro and then looking at, at a carcass weight value in the sub-index of plus 10 kilo. Now, obviously, on a crossbred herd, that would be higher. Um, like Paul mentioned, farmers have their own requirements for their own herd, so they're picking probably on calf and ease, and he mentioned the gestation length. And then based on that, you're looking at what sires in the DBI lie close to that 10 kilo carcass weight value in the sub-index. Now, even between breeds and within particular breeds, there can be huge variation in sires. So it is worthwhile just to take time, go through the list, what your requirements are for your herd, and then where they lie in within that 10 kilo carcass weight, and then prioritise those sires when you're selecting straws now. And like from the beef farmer perspective, you know, when you're talking to farmers or you're, you know, looking at, at um, I suppose, activity in marts, are there popular breeds, uh, popular markets in relation to specific calf breeds that are sold um, at marts or, you know, that are 
are gaining good value, but they're not necessarily, um, you know, disrupting gestation length, calving difficulty for the dairy farmer. Yeah, well, I suppose, I'm Louise, from the buyer's point of view, the popular calf really comes back to the price or the value of the calf, regardless of breed. So what the farmer is actually paying on the day when they're buying the calf which calf is actually going to leave a better margin on the farm when they bring the calf through to finish. So for farmers that are buying calves, they're using the new commercial beef value tool and that's really reflecting what profit those animals can bring into their dairy beef system. So it's really given farmers, now that are buying calves, extra confidence prior to what they had before. And they're looking at the CBV genetic value. So, you know, they have... They can see it probably in the martyring on the boards and also through the herd plus accounts. So really calves that are coming into the ring or that they're buying from farm to farm that have a higher CBV will on average grow faster, be finished faster and not eat as much per kilo live weight gained. So therefore them calves are looking at probably a higher price versus calves with a lower CBV. And the farmer has the tool now that allows them to see what decisions they're making before they actually buy the calf. Because really looking at calves, every calf probably looks the same until they're actually brought on true to finish. So by using the CBV, it's given the buyer a better chance as to what that calf will be when they're finished on their farm. So I suppose, Paul, from your experience previously as a beef farmer and now moved into dairy as a dairy farmer, what do you think the wider impact for an improved dairy beef calves and the genetics of the farm of these calves on farms can have? You want the calves to leave your farm, you know what I mean, in a good healthy condition and looking looking well. And also to the to the farmer that's buying them, you want him to make a profit as well. And you want him to, to get a good return and you want to see you want to, you'd like to see them thriving well too, having a kind of a decent kill out. Also like we as dairy farmers kind of have to try push this a little more because like the suckler herd is the suckler herd numbers is is uh, dropping, and there's going to be more men probably might come down the road of um, buying calves and rearing them to beef, and we want to want to be producing the right calf that will, will tick all the boxes, and also now I hate saying this, but uh, as much as a lot of us don't really have much time for beef factories, like I'm hearing reports of their boning halls given out about the amount of meat they're taking off some of the carcasses. And if we have better beef calves going forward, they will in turn have more beef coming that they're able to bone off their carcasses. And then it's kind of a win-win sort of for everyone. That's an interesting point, Paul. It's the next step along the the ladder. You know, you sell uh, a non-replacement calf from your farm to, you know, one of your two suppliers. And I suppose invariably within the next two years, that animal is hanging up in a factory and and being processed, and you know it, it makes an awful lot of sense. You know when you talk about the the amount of meat, and it comes back to your point, Catherine, on the the carcass value and the beef value that is associated with the animal and their potential um, to produce, um, I suppose, the valuable meat product. To to sum up, Paul, um, you know y- you you're I suppose deep into um you know, producing a beef, uh, for a valuable beef animal, um, you know, and you're looking at, um, I suppose, exotic breeds in my mind in, in terms of the continentals, um, you know, maybe your top couple of tips for dairy farmers who are, I suppose, putting more attention towards DBI uh, this year. There's no harm in trying a handful, four or five, you know what I mean? I put them on kind of good, decent cows and, and see how you get on. Because, like, the, the, the as I say, the Frisian cows is a great cow to calve. And, like, Frisian bull calves at the moment, like, there's someone were struggling to make 50 euros in the mart. And, like, if you can, like, the same amount of work goes into them as goes into a continental calf. And a continental calf could make 200. You know, so like it's about we put put more money into our pockets and doing the same work, you know, and and the straws are roughly the same price as well in 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 um in the AI companies. So, like I I would strongly urge farmers to um experiment just a handful even to see how they get on, and then if they grow a bit of confidence to get on well with the two or three or four wherever they choose to maybe double it up the following year or maybe more. 
Thanks very much, Paul. Some great advice and interesting insights. And thanks very much, Emma-Louise, also. Next, Joseph Dunphy from Grass Tin will give this week's grass and management tips. So we're coming off the back of another very wet week with considerable rainfall, leaving grazing very difficult on Irish beef farms. However, we know at this time of the year, ground can dry out very quickly, so it's important to be flexible and ready to go grazing when the weather allows. The winter has been long and both silage stocks and slurry storage are coming under pressure, so grazing will be very much welcomed on Irish beef farms. The two key grazing messages for this week are, number one, the paddocks for you to target to start grazing, and number two, the priority animals for you to start grazing with. So number one, the paddocks for you to target are, firstly start into paddocks with lower grass covers. So we're looking at covers between 500 and about 11, 1200 kilos of dry matter per hectare, or just in around two fistfuls of grass or less. These lower grass covers are better to tune animals back into grazing, and there'll also be faster regrowth and better quality there for the second rotation. Also aim to start grazing in paddocks that are closer to the yard and have better infrastructure. So that if weather comes good for a week, you can get out grazing, but also that it's simple that if you have one or two wet nights, that you can run animals back into the yard until weather clears up and then back out to grass again. Also, to start grazing paddocks that are your grazing paddocks, and when the animals, as we said, are tuned back into grazing, then move to your silage paddocks to get them clipped off before the latter part of March. And your priority animals that you should be starting with are your lighter animals or your growing animals, so your weanlings or your store cattle. It's easier to train these animals to graze and they are lighter on the ground, especially especially during wetter weather. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.